United Chairs for the kind introduction. So hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are. So today I'm going to present uh, the paper titled Accelerating CPU-Based Distributed DNA Training on Modern HPC Clusters Using Bluefield 2 DPUs. So this is the agenda of today's talk. First, I'm going to introduce the topic and uh, yeah, and explain the challenges. Then I will present the proposed designs and the performance evaluation. So deep learning can be considered as a technique to achieve artificial intelligence. It uses deep neural networks to do the prediction, classification, and the regression. So deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which in turn is a subset of artificial intelligence. So the main difference between the machine learning and the deep learning is the way we extract the features. In the machine learning, a data scientist will extract the features manually from the raw data. And uh, this is called the feature engineering. And feature engineering depends on the type of data and the model uh, you want to use. After extracting the features, you uh, then he will apply a machine learning model to get the prediction. However, in the deep learning, the feature engineering part is integrated into the model. So you don't have to extract the feature uh, manually, the model will do it for you. So by, by using this approach, we can get uh, better features and uh, uh, more accurate results. Uh, so this is why uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, applications where, the deep, uh, where people are using the deep learning. So in 2013, when Alex Frisowski proposed the LXNet and showed the world that the deep learning can, models can give the better result compared to machine learning model, he uh, trained that model on two GPUs. So at that time also, uh, the deep learning models were very large and uh, require very huge computation. So since then, several deep learning models have been, have been proposed in the literature that are bigger and deeper than the LXNet model, thereby increasing the computation power requirement exponentially. So this figure represents that trend. So before 2012, the computation requirement in artificial intelligence was doubling every two years. So following the Moore's law, that is why we were able to train the models on a on the latest architectures. However, after the 2012, we are seeing that the computer requirement, computational requirement is doubling every three to four months. Therefore, the current generation uh, HPC class architectures cannot keep up uh, with the ever increasing computation requirement and we need distributed training to train such model. In the past couple of years, we have seen that most of the state-of-the-art models cannot be trained on a single GPU or a CPU. We need distributed training to train such models. So traditionally, GPUs have been used to train the deep neural networks, but CPUs still dominates the HPC arena and they can also be used for the deep learning. So that is why we, have, we are seeing the seeing that CPU-based uh, deep learning training is gaining a lot of traction. So, so in short, the growth in the deep learning uh, is motivated by the availability of the computation power and the large data set. So what are the trends in modern HPC architecture that is driving uh, that uh, area? So on the one side, we have the multi and many core processors like uh, Intel CPUs and ARM CPUs or the wafer scale CPUs from the different vendors like the Cerebras. And on the other hand, we have the accelerators like uh, uh, NVIDIA GPUs, AMD GPUs, uh, which are designed uh, to accelerate the deep learning workloads. Uh, the one thing that is common uh, between these two approaches is that we need a high performance interconnect uh, and uh, SSD memory storage options. Uh, so when it comes to the deep learning, compute communication and IO, all of these are equally important. So 
if we want to uh, feed the data to the CPU, we need a high performance storage system so that we can read the data directly from the storage device and uh, train the model on it. Since we have very large models, so that is why we cannot keep uh, all the data into the primary memory. So, and uh, since we have, because of these high performance uh, uh, processors, uh, uh, we are creating an island of compute. So in order to communicate the data from one processor to another, we need a high performance interconnects to accelerate the training. So what makes an interconnect high performance? Low latency and high bandwidth are the no brainers, but there's something called the uh, low CPU overhead, which is uh, equally essential uh, when it comes to the performance. So if, uh, if you say that, uh, I'm going to communicate the data from one processor to another, but I will take 30 to 40% of the CPU also. Then the application developers will not be happy. They want all of the compute power for their application. They, want, they don't want to waste time on the communication. So that is why we need the interconnects with those who are CPU overhead. And this problem becomes more uh, prominent uh, when it comes to deep neural network training because uh, DNN wants all the compute power they can get. So the blue field uh, takes uh, the, a step forward and introduces the data processing code into the adapter. It uh, has the system on chip containing 64-bit ARM V8 A72 uh, core processors, which had eight cores. So now the question is, how can we use uh, uh, the bl uh, blue fields computing power and accelerate uh, the workloads. So uh, because of uh, the, because of this new computing power, the blue field TPUs ha have opened a new line of research and uh, the opportunities for the application developers to accelerate uh, their applications. When it comes to the uh, deep learning, we need all, since we need all the compute power we can get. Uh, so, so that is why in this, uh, paper, we are going to discuss how we can use the DPUs to accelerate the CPU-based BNN training. So, so le let me give you an overview of a distributed DNN training first. There are several polarization strategies in uh, distributed DNN training, namely data polarism, layer polarism, and the domain polarism. In the data parallelism, the model is replicated on uh, multiple machines uh, and uh, the data is distributed among these machines. We do the forward and backward pass simultaneously on all the machines and then we use the, the operation or reduce operation to synchronize the weights. So data parallelism is one of the most common and widely used technique in distributed DNA training as it gives a very good performance uh, for the in-core models. By in-core model, uh, models, I mean the models that can be that can fit inside the memory of a single processor or a GPU. On the other hand, we have the layer parallelism and the domain parallelism. So these uh, kind of parallelism are more suitable for the model that cannot fit inside the memory of a single processor. So the model is very big, and uh, so that is why it cannot fit inside the memory of a single GPU. So that is where the layer parallelism and domain parallelism are mostly used. In layer parallelism, the model is divided into the, uh, divided among the machines at the granularity of the layer. So here we are placing the layer one on the machine one, layer two on machine three, and so on. Layer parallelism uses point-to-point -point operations to do the forward and backward pass. In the domain parallelism, we distribute the layer itself on multiple machines. So since uh, uh, in deep, uh, deep neural networks, we have different types of layers. So that is why uh, this parallelism is dependent on the type of the layer we have and the, uh, and the model. So in when it comes to the convolution neural network, we have a spatial and channel parallelism where uh, in a spatial parallelism, we distribute the image along X and Y uh, axis. So basically we are putting the different part of images on a different uh, uh, machines. And uh, in the channel parallelism, we uh, distribute uh, along the channel dimension. So layer parallelism and the domain parallelism are, are uh, 
mostly suitable for the out of core model but when it comes to the cpu based uh, deep neural network training we have lot of memory available so most of the model can fit inside the memory of a single uh, processor so that is why in this paper we are going to focus mainly on the data parallelism as it gives uh, the best performance for the uh, in core models so the, this is the broad challenge we uh, we want to solve in this uh, uh, paper how can deep learning take the advantage of emerging network technologies and accelerate the cpu based dnn training by utilizing the blue fields dpu compute power so how to make a training faster how can what are the factors that affect the distributed performance of the distributed dnn training so deep learning frameworks are no brainers like we need a very fast deep learning frameworks that can utilize all the compute power of a single uh, processing element so tensorflow pytorch mxnet and lben are the deep learning frameworks that are highly optimized for several architectures like uh, nvidia C and gpus uh, intel cpus and uh, on the other hand uh, we need uh, the a very good data parallelism support uh, if you are going to if your data parallelism uh, implementation does not uh, have overlapping of computation and uh, communication and uh, advanced uh, optimization techniques like the tensor fusion then you will not get a very good scalability so that is why uh, we have horovod which is a uh, distributed training middleware and uh, which implements the data parallelism support for tensorflow pytorch and mxnet TensorFlow and PyTorch also have their own native uh, solutions, but in this paper we are going to use the Horovod. And last but not the least are the communication libraries for the deep learning. So if your communication library is not uh, optimized for the uh, deep learning workload, then you will not get a very good performance. For example, uh, we need to optimize the large message all reduce operations. Uh, so these uh, operations are uh, highly optimized in the libraries like the mapitch2 mapitch2 gdr or the intel mpi we have the other communication and times also from the vendors like uh, uh, the nvidia nickel which uh, works only on the nvidia so gpu so now uh, so in this paper uh, we make following key contributions we present the performance characterization of data parallelism on cpu and dpu using a multi process per node configuration several papers uh, uh, exist in the literature that shows that uh, if you run multiple processes on a single processor then you will get a very good performance on cpu so that is why we need we characterize uh, uh, the performance using this configuration and then we propose several offloading designs uh, to accelerate the dnn training and uh, then we uh, we also present the performance evaluation on three different deep learning models like RealNet 20 RealNet 56 and the ShuffleNet on three different uh, data sets these are the computer vision data sets cypher 10 svhn street view house numbers and the tiny image net data set and in the end we scaled the proposed designs to 16 nodes and show that we have the consistent improvement for multiple uh, node experiments so, so how can we exploit the DPUs for the deep neural network training? There are several phases in the deep neural network training. So for example, first you need to uh, fetch the training data. So you will read the training data from the uh, memory. Then you will apply some data augmentation functions like uh, random flip, random rotation. These uh, data augmentation function helps uh, in generalization of a model. So you will get a better generalization on the testing accuracy. Then we train the model using the forward pass, backward pass, and the weight update. So this is what we call the training uh, process. So this is the one epoch. After completing one epoch, we validate the model on the validation data set so that uh, we can see that if the model is training uh, correctly or not. So these are the different pages that can be uploaded to the DPUs to accelerate the training. So so a naive approach would be to upload everything to the DPUs. So, uh, so basically we can create the, 
data parallelism replica on both CPU and DPU and do the training. So on the DPUs, we will do all of these steps like fetching of training data, data augmentation, forward pass, backward pass, rate update, and all of these things on the DPUs. So this is the one approach. Then this is what we call the offload naive. So here we are showing this approach for the two node case. We are, we are creating multiple uh, replicas on the CPUs as I've said earlier. Uh, the multi-process single node uh, gives the best performance. So that is why we are creating multiple replicas on CPUs and we are doing the same thing for the DPUs. So since uh, DPUs are not as powerful as the CPUs, so that is why we need to distribute the work according to the, their capacity. So in order to do that, we need to first characterize the performance on single CPU and DPU so that we can distribute the work between the CPU and DPU. So here we are showing the result for the CPUs and this is the result for the DPU. So as you can see that we have a very, very large difference between the performance. Here we are easily achieving the 28 images per second, but here we are processing only one or two images per second. So OMP num threads can be used to, to uh, optimize the performance. So that is why we are showing the uh, performance for different cases. So in the further ex uh, experiments, we are using OMP num thread equal to two for all the experiments. In case of CPU, we, we saw that when we are using the OMP num thread equal to three, it, it, it was not able to scale to uh, eight or 16 GPUs. We were not getting very good scalability. That is why we reduced the OMP num thread equal to two. So now I present after, based on the previous uh, experiments, uh, we distribute the work between the CPU and DPU by using the time per iteration. So basically the forward pass and backward pass should take uh, same time on CPU and DPU. So that is why we will, uh, so basically we will give, let's say 32 samples to CPU and we will give only two samples to the uh, DPU so that uh, the time per iteration can match. So based on this, uh, based on these, uh, this approach, we report up to 1.03 X speed up for the CPU plus DPU using the offload naive. So here the maximum speed of possible is 1.04 X because uh, we just uh, did like uh, the maximum images per second processed by the DPU is 1.5 and the maximum images processed by the CPU is 30. So we, we calculated this maximum speed up using that approach. So as you can see that uh, offload naive does not give the significant speed up uh, because the forward and backward pass are compute intensive tasks and DPUs are not as powerful as CPUs so that they can do the, uh, the forward and backward pass in the less amount of time. So that is why we need the advanced offloading designs to get the better performance when it comes to the CPU plus DPUs. So here we have divided the, uh, the training into three phases. Uh, so data augmentation, training, and the model validation. In data augmentation, we are going to uh, fetch the training data and uh, uh, apply the random alterations like uh, random rotation, flip, uh, or random flip to achieve better generalization. This is a very well-known technique in the computer vision area. So after that, we are going to train the model and then we will do the model validation. So we profiled the uh, profiled and these three phases on different models and uh, on different data sets. So here the crux is that the time, obviously the training is taking the most of the time, but uh, data augmentation will take around four to 12% of the time. And the model validation is going to take two to 10% of the time. So we can offload these two uh, phases to DPUs and accelerate uh, the training. So this is the main idea behind uh, uh, the paper. So now I present the first design that is the that is offloading the data augmentation part. So here we offload the training, reading of training data from the memory and data augmentation to DPU. Here we are showing that thing we are doing. Uh, so that is why we are creating two types of processes. One is training processes that are on CPUs and the second one is the data augmentation processes that are on DPUs. So, we initialize this two buffer to enable the synchronous communication and each training process has one data augmentation process on DPUs. So now the second design is offloading the model validation. So in this uh, approach, we offload the validation of model to the uh, of the model to the DPU. So after 
uh, after completing an epoch, the CPU will send the train weights to the uh, DPU and then it will start the next epoch. In the meantime, the DPU will uh, do the model validation. So in this approach also, we are creating two processes that is training processes on CPUs and testing processes on DPUs. And we divide the validation data equally uh, among the testing processes. Now, the third approach is uh, offload hybrid. Here we combine both of these approaches. So just think of it in this way. If the data augmentation is not taking much time on uh, DPUs and uh, the training on the TPU, DP, uh, DP is taking longer, so we, in the meantime, we can do the model validation. So, so that is why we create two more types of processes on DPUs, data augmentation and testing both on the DPUs so that we can achieve some more benefit, uh, some more improvement. So here is the process placement in the hybrid offloading. So here we are creating the 16 processes, eight on the CPUs and eight on the DPUs, but out of those eight processes, four are used for the data augmentation and four are used for the testing. So here we are just showing that since we have more training processes, so each data augmentation process will uh, transfer, will give data to multiple training processes. So now uh, we have evaluated our uh, designs on the HPC Advisory Council High Performance Computing Center, which has 32 compute nodes with the Broadwell series of Geon dual socket and uh, the NVIDIA Bluefield 2 adapters. In, the, in these experiments, we have used the MRPH2 communication runtime and the NPR for PY library for the wrapper to, uh, so that we can use the NPI library in the Python. And uh, we, are, we have implemented our designs in PyTorch version 1.19, and uh, we have used Horobot for the distributed DNN training support. So now I present uh, the numbers for the ResNet 20 on Cypher 10 dataset. So here we saw that uh, the offloading the data augmentation gives the best performance, and we are, on a single load we were getting around 13.8 percent speed up, and when we scale the uh, when we scale the experiments to 16 nodes, we were getting the consistent uh, improvement. We were able to achieve an, an average of 13.9 speed up on one to 16 nodes. So then we tried ResNet 56 on the SVHN dataset. So SVHN dataset is just like the Cypher 10 dataset, but since the ResNet 56 uh, is a larger model compared to ResNet 20, so it, that is why it was taking more time on in training on the CPUs. So that is why we added, that is why the we added the validation part to the DPUs also, and we got the better performance with the uh, hybrid design. So here we are able to achieve up to 10.1% speed up. And on the multi-node, in the multi-node setting also, we were able to get uh, the 9.3% speed up uh, on 16 nodes. Now I present the numbers for the shuffle net model on the tiny image net data set. So the tiny image net data set has, la has uh, larger images. So in the cipher, we have 32 by 32 pixel images. However, in the image net data set, we have uh, larger images. So that is why the data augmentation time also increased. So, so that is why just offloading the uh, data augmentation was giving us uh, the better performance. That is that was equivalent to 12.5 percent speed up, and on the on the multi node setting also we were able to get uh, the 10.2 percent speed up on uh, 16 nodes. So to conclude this talk, we are uh, in this paper we proposed several novel offloading designs for DPUs. Uh, namely offload naive data augmentation, model validation, and hybrid. We report up to 15% improvement for our designs for the data sets like Cypher 10, SVHN, and Tiny Media data set. And we have also demonstrated that we are able to get a consistent performance gain on multiple nodes. We have implemented our designs in the PyTorch using the Horobot. And in future, we would like to use the DPUs to accelerate the DNN training on GPUs and evaluate the transformer models also. Thank you. So now I would like to take any questions. Hey, thanks, uh, Arpan. Um, thank you for the good presentation. And 
I, I don't see many uh, questions and uh, the Slack channel at this point. So I, I encourage everyone to post your questions there uh, for uh, Arpan. Um, so I, to just start a discussion, I, I, I'll start with one question. Um, mm -hmm. So you were mentioning about the offload validation model and you said uh, for communication from the CPU to the TPU, you were using a point-to-point -point operation. Um, yes. Have you considered using like a one-sided operation, um, one-sided communication operation, you know, to improve um, more, okay. more sort of overlap? Yes, so that's, uh, that's a very good question. So for the model validation, we were using the blocking and point-to-point uh, -point operations because in the next training step, we will update the weights. So that is why uh, we were not uh, using the one-sided communication or the asynchronous communication. However, in the data augmentation side, we were using the asynchronous communication. I see. So I see a question in the, the Zoom channel. So can you elaborate yeah. on uh, what aspects were added or available that help training? So this is on a question on, in, on MPI. So what aspects were added or available that uh, Oh, we haven't, uh, okay, okay. we haven't added anything to the NPI. We have used out of the box uh, MOPH to implementation just to get uh, the, so basically we were using only the already operation from the NPI. And uh, uh, for the, from the NPI, since we have our own designs, so like we were also using a synchronous communication like as I send and I receive and blocking point to point operations. We haven't updated the NPI like this. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so uh, one one last question I had was that in case of in the in the training loading and data augmentation and you have the mm -hmm. forward pass and the backward pass, um, mm -hmm. did you consider using? So it it appears that you are having it as a single process and a single thread. Did you appear consider using like a circular buffer and an ULT yes. for processing it? Uh, that yes. way you can pipeline those steps and that yes. might improve your speed up. Yes. Yes, so we tried using the circular buffer for the data augmentation so that we can uh, have the better performance. However, we have seen that uh, we, we saw that we were not getting any improved performance. So that is why we, uh, we had only one buffer in the lab at the end. However, on the training side, we do have multiple buffers to enable the asynchronous communication. All right, so thank you. Thank you, Arpan. Uh, so I will encourage everyone to you know, continue to post your questions uh, on the on the Slack channel for this paper, and I will recommend that when you have a look at it toward the day, if new questions arise, so that you can answer them. Okay, I yeah. appreciate it. Thank you, Thank you so much. Okay.